Thank you very much. Um, I'll try to make this brief. The exhibition covers 400 years, um, so you can realize there's going to be some compression. Uh, this is an exhibition that might well have been constructed for this symposium, or conversely, the symposium for the exhibition. Neither one of them is true. Um, the circumstance has to do with the zeitgeist. And the only problem is that the zeitgeist is off calibration by one week. Uh, the exhibition will open in one week from now. And so what I'm going to give you tonight is just a, a brief kind of, I hope, tantalizing sense of what's in it. Uh, it'll have to take the form of a kind of uh, delayed gratification, uh, which I hope will encourage you to come back and have a look at the exhibition when it does open. It'll be up until October 7th. Can I have the first slide on the left? Okay, and the light's down. The exhibition is called The Unfinished Print, a very blunt and by some accounts unimaginative title, but it does say what it is that I mean, and, and it is in a sense essentially appropriate to what it is that you're considering. Um, it's, to put it in art historical parlance, the non finito problem in the history of printmaking. And what I do is make a case or try to make a case for the fact that prints have a very special status in this context. That is to say, there's something about prints, uh, about the nature of their making especially, that causes them to be separable from other modes of working up an object that reflects on the question of non finito in ways that are kind of revealing and suggestive. Uh, the basic facts here have to do with the nature of what it means to make a print, at least in the standard classical forms, namely an engraving or an etching. You begin with a plate, uh, you work on that plate, and the image gradually accumulates in the course of that work. But it's an artifact of the technology, so to speak, that as you do this, you take impressions as you go along, or you may do, you may not do, but typically was done because you're working in reverse uh, and you're working on a plate which is difficult to read and the product, so to speak, is something that issues from it and has a fundamentally different character. And this is, as I say, simply um, something that derives from the technology itself, but what it yields is um, a scattered kind of record depending upon when and how and why people chose to retain these impressions. Uh, a record of the development of a thing, uh, the record of an evolution that is not just a sort of gestation but a kind of, of track of the genesis itself. And one can talk about this naturally in relation to a painting where one finds very often preparatory drawings that are accumulated and so forth in advance of a painting, oil sketches and so forth. But the distinctive thing about a print is that these alterations are made in the very matrix that yields the final image. So it constructs a sort of palimpsest that resolves itself in a certain way. And my, my premise is that printmakers took this matter very seriously, not just as a practical matter, but the very fact of having been able to accumulate records of this kind may have caused them to reflect on the nature of how they proceeded from one stage to another in ways that were perhaps different. Um, and there is a history here, uh, a history of greater and lesser interest that we can trace through surviving impressions, and one that extends the problem beyond simply the question of recording process to the issue of an interest in variability in general in printmaking. Uh, the obvious character of a print, uh, initially at least, is its uniformity, the possibility of reproducing a great number of things that are, um, as Ivan's referred to it, exactly repeatable pictorial statements. Uh, printmakers fairly early on started to resist that, uh, partly for commercial reasons, partly because they were more imaginative than, than that. Uh, there's always a tension throughout this history between uh, the, the prerogatives of commerce on the one hand and the tendency to experiment, which I think may have a great deal to do with the fact that they were playing with a new kind of technology, albeit a rather simple kind of technology. So that's the, the general premise that underlies this, and I began to look at the question over a broad period of time with the assumption that 
an interest in these variants uh, along the way kinds of prints was something that would, uh, that would rise in a kind of steady fashion, that it would, would form a fairly clear trajectory. And in fact, it doesn't. Um, it goes through some fascinating kinds of oscillations. Artists' interest in this dimension of their work and indeed, correspondingly, collectors' interests in having it. And this is an essential dialectic that runs throughout the whole history of the story. That is, printmakers start to retain things, uh, and then they begin to attract the attention of collectors, and that motivates them to start playing around in a variety of ways with their plates and with their papers and so forth, the way they print things to generate uh, special impressions of things. And it becomes almost cultic at certain phases. And then there are other stages where there's a, an outright resistance to this. Uh, and this is a, a question that can be connected with, with shifts in, for example, the history of art theory in Western Europe. Now, the first print we know of that was manifestly unfinished, Hendrik Goltzius's Adoration of the Shepherds, manifestly unfinished and meanwhile uh, something that was of interest, that is to say, was purveyed, uh, was sold by not the artist, but his son-in-law, clearly attracted interest, has a special sort of status. It begins the story. There are a number of proof impressions that survive before that, but this, in a way, is a stepping off point. And it's a particularly interesting one because it arises out of a visual culture that was intensely invested in high degrees of finish, over-refinement, one might say. Goltzius, in fact, is on record as having uh, not allowed people to see his work until it was completed. His son-in-law overrode that, probably posthumously, uh, but certainly as a testimonial to the master's hand. What's striking about it, I think, is that as you look at it, um, see the figure of the shepherds on the left, Joseph in the center, extending a candle forward into the void where the Christ child eventually would have emerged, and on the right-hand uh, side, the virgin. Um, it strikes us moderns, I think, uh, immediately as an architectonic construction that really couldn't be added to without deficit. Uh, it's magnificently composed. I would not by any means suggest that Goltzius intended to leave it for that purpose, but the fact remains. And uh, the fact also remains that this object was chosen, selected out, and pervade uh, possibly within Goltzius's lifetime and certainly immediately after his death. So there's a beginning point here. The circumstances are special, but they're intriguing. 35 years later, could I have the next slide on the left? 35 years later, you come to Rembrandt, um, who begins to do things like this. In fact, he did a number of plates like this. They're, the, they're, they're referred to as, as sketch sheets for obvious reasons uh, appropriate to our interests here. And they're initially, of course, highly experimental. They're obviously experimental. They're bizarre. They're oftentimes random. This is among the most peculiar. But more peculiar than that is the fact that the evidence of watermark suggests that these objects were actually disseminated at the time. Uh, it wasn't simply a question of Rembrandt playing around with a plate in order to improve his capacity for refined etching. Rembrandt was doing something else. Exactly what he was doing is a difficult question to answer, particularly since this is early on in his career. These come from the, six, uh, the 1630s, which um, is, a, is a, a surprising moment for someone to presume, let's say, that people would be interested in these kinds of toss-offs from his studio. But apparently they were. Apparently they were. And there are enough of them to suggest that he um, took this quite seriously and indeed came back to them, altered them, uh, sometimes cut them up, and made them into different prints. But a composition like this comes across initially as completely bizarre. I've oriented it this way. The gallery has it matted um, uh, 90 degrees around. I kind of like this because of the magnificent study of the beret and the one eye staring at us, which is... Uh, possibly a self-portrait, who knows, one can hardly say. Uh, my guess is that Rembrandt is kind of playing with us on that front. Directly above the hat, you'll see uh, a little detail of an eye, uh, which has been worked as though it were the other eye. And then, of course, probably the first composition was this little landscape that you see projected off over the top. Rembrandt is the person who really explodes the whole question of unfinished. That is to say, he opens up all the doors in the issue um, and I think is, in this regard, uh, a fundamental uh, prophet of modernity. 
and therefore the exhibition concentrates on him at a significant moment. Um, he is given one full room and the full range of possibilities of finish and unfinish as they emerge in his work are explored. Could I have the next slide on the left? The remote isn't responding. In a certain sense, the whole question for Rembrandt can be summed up in this print. Um, manifestly unfinished, there's no question about that. This wasn't, this wasn't abandoned intentionally, I don't think, although people have actually argued that. It's a fascinating print um, in part because it is an allegory of the arts and it is specifically about drawing, about the means and the implications of drawing. What you see in the unfinished areas in the lower portion is an artist on the left, uh, suggestive enough of a self-portrait that we may take it as a self-portrait in some generic sense, looking at a model, uh, obviously modeled on a, a classical Venus type with consequent allusion to a muse. Uh, in a studio, the muse bears a palm shown in two forms, the loosely sketched dry point in the lower portion of it and the finished work above it. Other props around, studio props you can see hanging there, and just behind him a blank canvas uh, with the top of an easel resting above it and sculpture, so it's also a paragone. There can't be any doubt this is an allegory of the arts. Uh, there can't be any doubt that it's a reflection on the art of drawing and that, que that, that the, the, the basic questions of 17th century thinking on this matter are being raised here, uh, namely the proper relationship to nature and the proper relationship to antiquity. But the print was abandoned at this stage. Uh, we have no notion why. It's been suggested that Rembrandt may have meant to leave it this way as a demonstration piece. Um, I don't believe that, but the fact is, again, that this print was printed and circulated within Rembrandt's lifetime. We can't say for certain that it was done so by him, but there's every reason to suppose that it was. A case like this suggests that Rembrandt had a very high degree of self-consciousness about the nature of his own process and the importance not just of recording it, but also of disseminating it, and indeed disseminating it beyond, let's say, the circle of workshop apprentices, artists, and so forth, to an audience that um, we would classify now as collectors. The other dimensions of Rembrandt's interest in unfinished, I think, are known to most of you. Um, could I have the next slides left and right? namely the great cases of um, variations in states. I show you just one instance of that here, the uh, famous three crosses, which you see on the left in a first state and on the right-hand side in the final fourth state, where the whole plate has been violently reworked, uh, a major figure introduced to the center, the whole thing scored over with Buren and dry point to create what is in effect an entirely different image, and certainly one that is profoundly different in mood and character. The question arises why Rembrandt chose to develop that image in this way, uh, effectively to, to engage in an act of iconoclasm on an earlier image in order to bring forth an entirely new conception, rather than, as we might imagine, it might have been easier to have begun with, with a different plate. There, there's an implication about the importance of process and about the engagement with the material and the technology of printmaking here that is, I think, fundamental. Rembrandt's reputation um, varied. In the 18th century, he was widely criticized for the roughness of his style, uh, and many people remarked on the fact that he left so many things unfinished. It was a problem for them in somewhat the same way that Vasari found Michelangelo and Leonardo's work to be a problem, but it was reinforced by classical theory at this point. And so a debate arose. The 18th century was a quite different climate in general so far as the question of prints and their value and understanding was concerned, uh, at least in, we might say, official or conventional forms of patronage. Next slides, left and right. And here the exhibition takes a turn um, to reproductive prints um, after paintings. Um, Watteau, Fragonard, and so forth. Uh, this is a case of an etched-only proof on the left-hand side, a little difficult to make out, but I think you'll see it's all there, and on the right-hand side, the finished proof, which has been worked up with an engraving tool. This is a, an extremely interesting moment. Uh, these paintings are intended, of course, to evoke the qualities of the paintings they copy. It was made for a corpus of paintings by Watteau, the so-called Recueil Julien. Uh, 
the proof states, etched only proof states, were issued in significant number. The gallery has quite a large collection of them. Um, significant enough number that they were clearly distributed and valued. The implications are clear there. In the 19th century, they were highly valued, but it was, uh, it's obvious that simply from their presence that this was also true at the time in which they were made. It's interesting here to reflect on the implication of this difference. What you have in, in the first go-round in the drawing with the etching needle, which gives you more or less the complete composition, is something that is essential and by its very nature a print. Whereas in the other, you have an endeavor that is really directed towards subordinating itself to the demands of a painting. And to me, or at least this is how I interpret this phenomenon, to me what we have here is a kind of, of resistance to that, uh, we might say a resistance to uniformity in a general sense, and also appreci an appreciation for qualities of drawing that become manifest more fluidly and beautifully in the first stage of activity, namely what we might call the sketch, although it would be wrong, I think, to refer to this um, in, in a conventional sense as a sketch, but nevertheless a previous stage of, of uh, becoming. The other half of the 18th century uh, engages Piranesi um, on a kind of eccentric track, um, semi my own, namely looking at Piranesi's work uh, at his process, in particular in relationship to his subject matter, namely the ruin, uh, and the way in which Piranesi approaches his plate, uh, oftentimes aggressively, and I developed this into a kind of uh, proto-romantic Sturm und Drang reading of an interest in not only underfinish in the state changes that you find there, but also extending into dimensions of overfinish. I'm going to leap from here. I'll just mention a couple of things that I think you will find interesting. These are also discussed in the catalog. Uh, in the 19th century, the question kind of explodes in a very multifaceted way. Um, there's a marvelous series of states of a print by the French artist Charles Marion, um, which he goes through a series of stages, uh, encounters Baudelaire at one point, uh, is committed to Charenton, uh, a psychoanalytic hospital, emerges and produces the final state of the print after he returns from the hospital. The plate effectively but very ambiguously and fascinatingly chronicles the state of Marion's mind as he moves through it, almost as, as if he were, well, I, I guess I wouldn't say th uh, that it was an act of therapy. Uh, I'd stop short of that, but in any case, um, he made use of it as, as a reflection of his own condition. And the exhibition ends uh, in the early part of the 20th century with Gauguin and some of Gauguin's um, cruder techniques for generating printed images that were kind of technical maneuverings intended to generate a kind of, of uh, primitivism, um, a, a sort of, of contradiction in terms, if you like, that, that uh, leads us into a point where I draw the line uh, beyond my competence. The 20th century comes after, and in a certain sense, I think it's fair to say that the whole issue of finish and unfinish finish becomes uh, indefinitely suspended. So far as the considerations here are concerned, I might just... Um, mention a couple of things that seem to me to reflect on the problem of the sketch. Um, there's a parallel here in the history of the print, the unfinished print, um, in the visual arts with what um, particularly Paul Sanger was talking about, the edited draft of a text, or for that matter, of a piece of music which is not something one can find in quite the same way in other dimensions of the visual arts. Uh, it's clearly an artifact of the print revolution. That's fundamental, I think, to understanding what's going on here. And secondly, it's interesting to me, at least, that we have, in effect, rough drafts for Rembrandt's prints, um, but we don't have any rough drafts for, say, Shakespeare's plays. And that fact alone is, is suggestive, and I will pause there, and if people have questions, I would be happy to answer them. Thank you.